on the feast days that the church has about John the Baptist, both one for his birth and another for his martyrdom. The church prays that he is the last and greatest of all the prophets. As the letter of the Hebrews tells us, God spoke to his people over the centuries, over the millennia, in fragmentary and varied ways through the prophets, giving a glimpse here, an insight there, a particular prophecy, never the whole picture all at once, but gradual preparation for the revelation of Christ, who is the perfect and full image of the Father. Fragmentary and varied ways through the prophets, up until the time, as Jesus says here in this passage, that John the Baptist appeared. He was the one to bring all these prophecies to their culmination. All of them were pointing ahead to Christ, and he was the one then able to say, Look, behold, here is the Lamb of God. These words, of course, that we repeat in every Mass. Now there was, if you look at the way that the Old Testament ends, I'm going to go right to the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, a short book, just three chapters, but it's the last book of the Old Testament, and here's how it concludes. Lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet, Before the day of the Lord comes, that great and terrible day, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with doom. The Jewish people on great solemnities have always left a chair empty for Elijah. A chair at the table that Elijah can take when he comes. Drawn from this concluding verse of the Old Testament scriptures, the expectation is that Elijah comes to usher in the Messiah. And today, Jesus is telling us, here is how that prophecy of Malachi was fulfilled. That it was John the Baptist who was Elijah. Now, in the beginning of Luke's gospel, when John's parents are told about him, and you remember what happened, his father was Zechariah, and we hear this gospel uh, Canticle of Zechariah on the uh, Mass of uh, Christmas Eve day. He is made mute. The promise is given. He's not so sure what to think about it. And he is made mute until the time that this is fulfilled. But what the angel says about John, who is to be born, is the following. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers toward children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to prepare a people fit for the Lord. Okay, so here we have various Advent themes coming together. First of all, the Lord who comes was foretold. And this is all part of the plan of God. He's the Messiah. He will bring salvation not only to souls, but to bodies and to all of nature. As the first reading today made clear, the dry land bursting forth into streams, all the vegetation, life. The Messiah comes to bring life, and that's reflected even in nature. Second point is that his coming requires preparation. Remember, John 
brought a baptism of repentance. People were coming to him, confessing their sins, going down into the water in the Jordan, coming back up again as a sign that God is going to cleanse us of sin. He wants to make a, give us, as Ezekiel had said, a new heart and a new spirit. So the coming of Christ is not just, you know, we sit back and we, uh, you know, wait for his coming and he comes and everything's okay and we don't have to change and we don't have to be challenged and we don't have to rethink things and we don't have to repent. But we do have to repent. We have to identify what sin is. We have to know the difference. We have to understand that there are boundaries to being a Christian. There are certain things we never do. There are certain things we do not believe. There are other things we always do and we always believe. And it's time to get in the right lane and get our thinking straight and get our behavior reformed to be able to welcome the Lord. And then... This spirit and power of Elijah, you know, this prophecy at the end of Malachi talking about the fact that Elijah will come. And Jesus saying this is fulfilled in John the Baptist. Talks about one of the most basic and important dynamics in society that fathers love their children and children obey their fathers. God is father. He's the source of all fatherhood. And fatherhood means protection and provision and nurturing with strength, giving of life. Aren't so many of the problems in our society caused by the absence of fathers, caused by weakness of fatherhood? It's amazing how Scripture focuses on that relationship, turning the hearts of fathers toward their children, as God the Father has his heart turned toward his children. And Elijah, the spirit and power of Elijah, you know what Elijah means. My God is Yahweh, as opposed to other false gods. Elijah, remember on the cross Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, what does that mean? My God, my God, Eli, Eli. So Elijah, my God, is Yahweh. Ja, Yahweh. He is my God because Elijah stood up before the evil king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And he said to them, you are causing trouble for God's people. You are denying the covenant. You are a curse and he spoke mightily against the evil king. What he also spoke mightily about was the false prophets. You know, they were worshiping Baal, the ancient Canaanite god, and part of that ritual was sacrificing their children, killing their sons and daughters. And God tells us in the first book of Kings, this is in fact the reason for the exile. The reason for the exile, the killing, the sacrificing of their sons and daughters, the shedding of innocent blood in sacrifice to demons. Elijah calls together the prophets of Baal. He says to the Lord, it looks like I'm the only one standing up for you, Lord God. There are all these false prophets around. I'm the one who says, Elijah, my God is Yahweh. And he brought them together and he said, okay. And he said to the people, he said, I'm bringing these prophets together and I want you to make a choice. Elijah said, how long are you going to straddle the fence? If Yahweh, if the Lord is your God, then serve him. If Baal is God, well then serve him. But don't try to straddle the fence. Don't wobble along with two opinions. There's different ways that that exhortation of Elijah is translated. How long are you going to hold two opinions at once? How long are you going to try to follow two different gods? See, this is part of the Advent preparation. Who is the one who comes? Is the one who comes our God or not? If he is, stop following other gods. Stop following other gods. If he's the one, if Jesus Christ is the one, 
then his teachings are the teachings of God. Stop following other teachings. Stop following other gospels. If he's the Lord and Savior, then he's the center of gravity. Stop having other priorities above him. Jesus says the same thing Elijah says. If the Lord is God, follow him. No one can follow me, he said, unless he denies his very self and loves me more than he loves even mother, father, wife, children. I am first. In me, you will find the power to adequately love all those other people in your life and in the world. But I'm first, the Lord Jesus demands. The spirit and power of Elijah, no false gods, repent of sin, make him first. This is the spirit of Advent. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have sent Elijah. We thank you for the clear message of repentance that you yourself, O Lord, echoed, that St. Peter echoed, that the preachers of the gospel have echoed ever since. Purify us. Make us ready for the coming of the King. And let us have the joy of his salvation. Amen.